Any and all views expressed in The Devil in the Details are entirely my own. Although I am a member of the Church of Satan, I do not speak for the Church of Satan. Welcome to The Devil in the Details. I'm the Satanic Skeptic. In this episode, I'm going to continue my discussion of exorcism and demonic possession by looking at one of the most infamous and well-documented cases, that of Annalise Michel, which has been adapted several times into film, most famously, the 2005 movie The Exorcism of Emily Rose. I wrote an article about this for Skeptical Inquirer and later appeared on the podcast Three Tortured Souls to talk about the case with my friends Dave Schumacher, Tim Vickers, and Kenny Biddle. So if you like this episode, I suggest you go check that out as well. Ultimately, this is a tragic story of someone who died sincerely believing themselves to be possessed. I don't believe the evidence merits that conclusion, but let's explore the history of the case before we start getting into the specific claims for demonic possession. The majority of the information in this article comes from the book The Exorcism of Annalise Michel by anthropologist Felicitas Goodman, as well as several contemporary news articles. Goodman interviewed the priests involved in the case, she spoke to the parents, she was granted access to relevant materials such as court documents, cassette tapes, and even Annalise's own diaries. Altogether, Goodman's overview of the case is perhaps the most comprehensive. <laughs> Anna Elizabeth Michel, Annalise was a nickname, was born September 21, 1952, in the town of Klingenberg am Main in Bavaria, Germany, to devoutly Roman Catholic parents Joseph and Anna. Described as behaving like many girls from strictly Catholic Franconian families, she went to Mass twice a week, prayed rosaries, and wanted to grow up to become either a teacher or a catechist. There's no evidence to suggest that Annalise or any of her sisters were abused or neglected, nothing unusual in her early childhood or signs of mental illness. A psychiatrist who met with Annalise later in life, Dr. Lenner, believed that Annalise was a neurotic, a now outdated psychoanalytic term, manifested from having a father who didn't understand her and a mother for whom she had an intense hatred. Anna, Michelle's mother, was described by Annalise and her sisters as being overbearing, suffocating and controlling nearly every aspect of their lives. None of the girls were allowed to participate in typical social activities or attend social events, which were normal for girls of their age. They were strictly forbidden from interacting with members of the opposite sex, and weren't even allowed to go to a friend's house if that friend happened to have a brother. Annalise and her sisters were denied opportunities to cultivate healthy independence and coping mechanisms, which would be necessary in times of stress or crisis, something which absolutely contributed to Annalise's problems later in life. Dr. Leonard also noted Anna's frequent use of holy objects in prayer as a means of inflicting punishment on the girls, something which he believed contributed to Annalise's later aversion to prayer and religious iconography. On the other hand, Annalise explicitly denied harboring any such animosity towards her mother. I should also like to point out that Dr. Leonard was a psychoanalyst, so take that for what you will. In 1965, Annalise was enrolled at the Dalberg Gymnasium in Aschaffenburg, Germany. She was noted to be an exceptional student. Overall, she was described as happy, healthy, and energetic. In 1968, at the age of 16, Annalise experienced her first seizure, losing consciousness during class and entering what her friend described as a trance-like state. Later that night, she awoke suddenly, later claiming she felt as if something were pressing down on her. She couldn't move, couldn't speak, and lost control of her bladder. Although the experience frightened her a great deal, when it did not happen again, she put it out of her mind. On August 24, 1969, Annalise suffered another seizure, same symptoms, and this time her mother took her to see their family doctor, Dr. Vogt in Klingenberg, who referred them to a neurologist in Aschaffenburg, Dr. Siegfried Luthi. Dr. Luthi later told an investigator on February 9, 1977, that after the battery of tests, quote, neurologically and psychologically all findings were negative, and that Michelle's EEG showed a normal physiological alpha-type brain activity. Based on his findings, Dr. Luthi stated, I judged from the description I was given that this was probably a case of cerebral seizures of the nocturnal type, with the symptoms of a grand mal epilepsy. Tonic-clonic seizures, formerly known as grand mal seizures, comprise two stages, 
a tonic phase, and a clonic phase. According to John Hopkins Medicine, seizures may begin with a simple or complex partial seizure known as an aura, during which persons may experience sensations such as unusual smells, vertigo, nausea, or anxiety. During the tonic phase, persons may lose consciousness and experience bodily and respiratory paralysis, as the muscles involuntarily contract. Finally, during the clonic phase, the person's face, arms, and legs spasm and jerk uncontrollably and rapidly. When the body relaxes, the bladder may also release. There are conflicting accounts as to whether or not Dr. Luthi prescribed any anticonvulsant medications at this time, with Dr. Luthi himself referring to a missing letter dated July 16, 1976, in which he testified that he had in fact prescribed the anticonvulsant drug Zentropil, known in the U.S. as Dilantin, as early as August 25, 1969. Later, Dr. Luthi would state that that was false. Annalise was forced to withdraw from the 1969-70 school year after she contracted pleurisy and pneumonia, and later contracted tuberculosis. In February 1970, Annalise was admitted to a hospital in Aschaffenburg, which specialized in lung disease, but after failing to get better was admitted to a sanatorium, or a tuberculosis clinic, in Middleburg, Bavaria, on February 28th. Annalise's time both at the hospital and the clinic was difficult, and she would speak little of it afterwards. Having never been allowed to develop a sense of independence or self-reliance, she became depressed and withdrawn, something which was only made worse by the taunts and ostracism she had to endure from the other patients who mistook her shy, backwards nature for snobbishness. On June 3, 1970, while staying at the clinic, Annalise suffered a third seizure. Same symptoms, stiffness in the arms, a crushing sensation, inability to breathe, and a loss of bladder control. When her voice finally returned to her, she let out a scream which brought the nurses, and, the next day, much unwanted attention from the other patients. A few days later, by some accounts it was a week, a strange thing happened to Annalise while she was praying the rosary. There was a gentle prickling in her cheeks and her lip trembled. She let her hands drop in her lap, still holding the rosary. Something was so different this evening. A sweetness she had never known before made her ring. She looked out the window, as if trying to discover if that unearthly sweetness had perhaps entered from there those mountains. How strange. She had not previously noticed that those forbidding mountains out there were so beautiful. The peaks glowed in altar gold and pink, and silver streamers tumbled toward blue-black depths. What snapped Annalise out of her trance-like state of wonder was the other girls asking her if she was okay. They described her hands like you had a cramp or something, like when my cat stretches her claws, and described her eyes. I thought they were blue. Now they're all black. For her part, Annalise stated that in a mirror it really did look as though her eyes were darker and her face appeared rosy. She described the sweetness wafting about her like the fragrance of violets, and the euphoric feeling around the experience lasted into the next day. Annalise confided, it must be the Virgin Mary helping me. Anna Michelle would later describe witnessing her daughter in the exact same state, but described the whole thing as frightening in the context of her already believing her daughter was possessed. This is important because, one, the physiological symptoms, the experience of one's senses being enhanced, the contracting of the hands, the dilation of the pupils, make sense in the context of Annalise's later diagnosis. Two, it highlights the importance of doing the bare minimum of research. If all you do is watch YouTube videos or TikToks of people talking about this case, they may or may not go into all the details or treat some things uncritically. I've personally seen videos that bring up the whole cat paw thing, but they don't mention that other people besides just Anna Michelle made this same observation, and they don't relate it to the seizure symptoms that Annalise experienced, so you get this impression that it really is something weird and unexplained, and maybe it is demonic possession. I mean, could it be demonic possession? Maybe. Is that the most likely or reasonable explanation given the evidence? Doubtful. Michelle was examined by another neurologist, Dr. Von Haller, in Kempton. Another EEG showed an irregular alpha pattern with some theta and delta waves, but again, nothing pathological. Dr. Von Haller prescribed several anticonvulsant drugs for Michelle, although no record apparently remains specifying what drugs were prescribed. When praying the rosary later, Annalise would try to reclaim that ecstatic experience, but when nothing happened, she rationalized in her diary that the Virgin Mary must be busy helping someone else. That or the anticonvulsant drugs were actually working. A week after her third seizure marked the first time Michelle reported experiencing visual hallucinations, describing having seen Fratzen, German for grimacing face, for a brief moment while praying the rosary. As this was after she had been prescribed some form of anticonvulsant drugs, some people have speculated whether she was seeing things as a side effect of her medication and not as a result of her seizures. 
However, so far as I know, anticonvulsant medications do not typically induce visual hallucinations. Annalise was released from the hospital on August 29th, and a follow-up appointment was scheduled with a lung specialist in Miltonburg, Dr. Reichelt. It was upon arriving home from the clinic that people began noticing a change in Annalise's behavior. Her sister, Ruzwitha, stated Annalise was irritable and unhappy most of the time, prone to outbursts of anger. Folks at church noticed the change, too, that she had become withdrawn and moody. When school resumed, Annalise was a year behind, and this only added to the typical stresses of being a teenager. When she tried to reconnect with her friends, they were more interested in boys than hearing about what Annalise believed was a mystical experience. This furthered her depression and sense of alienation from her peers. As her friend from school, Maria, testified to the court, Annalise was changed. She was quiet and withdrawn from her friends. I also noticed that she kept wanting to carry on mostly religious conversations. Annalise became deeply invested in reading books and articles about the lives of different saints and local shrines. Several letters written to her family, friends, and people from church indicate Annalise felt particularly drawn to the life of Barbara Weigand, a Catholic mystic and prophetess who died in 1943, and had also claimed to experience visions of the Virgin Mary. Annalise already believed that she had had a mystical experience courtesy of the Virgin Mary, and this idea gradually evolved into the idea that her seizures, her visions, all of this she was made to suffer for some spiritual purpose. This belief was something her mother, Anna, did little to discourage, fearing the stigma associated with mental illness. When Thea Hein, a family friend and prominent member of their church, professed her belief that Annalise was possessed by the devil, Anna latched onto it. Her father, Yosef, however, remained skeptical. By the time of the appointment with Dr. Reichelt on October 6th, Annalise had experienced another seizure. The exact date is not given, as Anna only told Dr. Reichelt it had been recently. Annalise would go to the next two years without having another seizure, although she reportedly missed a lot of school due to myriad illnesses and general apathy. Then, on June 5, 1972, she experienced her fifth seizure, reportedly very severe, although I couldn't find any specific details. On September 5, 1972, Annalise visited Dr. Luthi once more and reported that she had had several more seizures since they last met. During this time, Dr. Luthi testified he prescribed Zentropil, one tablet in the morning, two at night, despite still not finding anything pathological in Annalise's EEG. Annalise would be seen by Dr. Luthi on January 18th, March 27th, and June 4th and 6th. On the June 4th visit, another EEG was conducted, which, again, detected nothing abnormal. Despite having been on various anticonvulsant medications for nearly five years, Annalise began to experience side effects which she did not immediately report to her doctor. First, she experienced prolonged stiffness in her arms, but more alarmingly, beginning in October, her olfactory hallucinations, otherwise known as phantosmia, returned as she began claiming to smell something akin to burning feces, which, initially, no one else could smell. She also continued to experience the visual hallucinations of grimacing faces from time to time, which, again, it's not clear what anticonvulsant medications other than Dilantin she was taking, or whether she was taking them according to her doctor's orders. Dilantin is not known to have any potential side effects, which may explain her hallucinations. By 1973, Annalise had enrolled in college to be a teacher, but struggled to finish her assignments, pay attention in class, even to get out of bed in the morning. Between March and April of 1973, she started complaining of hearing a rapping or knocking sound, first coming from the wardrobe, then the ceiling above the girl's bedroom, and finally the floor beneath. Now, I've seen various sources claim that, unlike Annalise's previous hallucinations, the strange sounds were also experienced by her sisters and mother. However, in John Duffy's Lessons Learned, the author explicitly states these sounds were not heard by any other members of her family. In Felicitas Goodman's book, it's stated that initially Anna Michelle dismissed them as a product of Annalise dreaming or having trouble with her hearing. But when the other girls started claiming to hear it as well, Anna Michelle then claimed to start believing that something supernatural was going on. Considering that Goodman had more access to materials and persons directly related to the case, I personally would trust Goodman's account over uh, Duffy's that in time other members of the family also heard the unexplained rapping sounds. Joseph Michelle, for his part, remained skeptical. I'll tell you what I think, if you want to hear it. Annalise is sick, and as to her sisters, well, young girls are sometimes hysterical. Everybody knows that, so maybe that's why they heard those things. Despite graduating from school, Annalise had fallen into a deep depression, complaining, I feel like I'm in a deep hole. Those pills of Dr. Luthi's don't help me. She confessed to her psychiatrist that she suffered from recurring thoughts of suicide, but couldn't bring herself to go through with it. 
At her father's suggestion, Annalise went with Thea Hein on a pilgrimage to San Damiano in Italy. Once there, Annalise would not enter the shrine. She recoiled from the sight of a crucifix and refused to drink the water of the spring, which, considering how unlikely it was that the water was filtered or purified in any way, and the number of visiting pilgrims who drank from it and slobber in it, that was probably for the best anyway. The events that happened at the shrine come to us third hand. Goodman spoke to one of the priests, Father Alt, who heard about the events from Thea Hein. According to Frau Hein, Annalise spoke to her in a deep and menacing tone, physically assaulted her by tearing off her metal, and this next part's kind of funny, exuded a foul stench that could be smelled by Frau Hein and the others on the bus, which was compared to either feces or something burning. I mean, that's purely subjective. Maybe she was just passing gas. Remember the case of Ronald Hunkler in the, the previous episode? Farts do in fact seem to be considered proof of demonic possession. Anna Michelle began urging her daughter to register for college, something which Annalise countered she was too depressed and too often plagued by visions of the grimacing faces to do. Her parents convinced her to schedule another appointment with Dr. Luthi for September 3, 1973, during which time Annalise confided, I often see Fratzen, ghastly, distorted faces. The devil is in me. I am all empty inside. Dr. Luthi would later testify that during this visit, she could not get her mind off these things, referring to Annalise's obsession with the idea she was possessed by the devil. Dr. Luthi also stated that Annalise appeared very disoriented, indecisive, random in thought. She had no power of decision, and everything was empty in her. That same month, Dr. Luthi also prescribed the antipsychotic medication paraciazine, otherwise known as Aolept. The Michelles never consulted Dr. Luthi again, with several sources conjecturing that the tone of the doctor was perceived as condescending, and the manner in which he treated Annalise was to blame for their reluctance. Around this time, Thea Hein, whom had initially made the suggestion that Annalise was possessed, contacted the Jesuit Father Adolf Rodewick, an expert on demonic possession who had written several books on the subject. Father Roderick wouldn't travel from Frankfurt to Klingenberg, so instead he recommended they see Father Hermann of the Mother of God Parish in Aschaffenburg. Father Herman met with Annalise ten times at his home and never once claimed to have witnessed anything that would have suggested demonic possession. Quote, We usually talked about her problem for half an hour to an hour. She was a nice young girl, obviously from a deeply religious home. She complained that she was no longer herself. I'm not my own ego anymore. Occasionally, she saw distorted faces, Fratzen, which she was unable to describe in detail. I suggested that she go to a neurologist. She told me that she had gone to Dr. Luthi, but he had not been able to help her either. From her parents, I heard that on occasion she evidenced disrespect towards sacred objects, and there was a stench of dung or of something burning in the room where she was. However, these symptoms never occurred in my apartment, although quite frequently I said the rosary with her. During such instances, she always behaved calmly and with piety and showed no such behavior. Father Herman suggested Annalise see a neurologist, which she refused. Father Herrmann then visited the aforementioned Father Ernst Alt of the St. Agatha Parish in Aschaffenburg. Father Alt had already heard of the case from Thea Hein and was immediately interested. Now, I have to go into a little bit about Father Alt, because he's going to become a central figure in the course of the exorcism of Annalise Michelle. Father Alt was an interesting priest with a prior interest in the paranormal. His 1973 thesis was entitled, Is There a Parapsychological and Biological Basis to Religious Experience? And according to various sources, such as Duffy and Goodman, he believed himself to have the abilities of telepathy, precognition, and dowsing. Father Alt claimed he had visions of Christ and heard voices speaking to him. This certainly opens the floor for questions of Father Alt's own mental health and competency. When he was evaluated in 1978 by a court-appointed psychiatrists, doctors Lungenhauser and Kohler, they concluded, In the case of Father Alt, we are dealing with an abnormal personality in the widest sense of the term. Parts of his prehistory, as he reported them, even suggest the presence of a psychosis of the schizophrenic type, although the findings cannot be construed as pointing to any symptoms that could prove this diagnosis. It wasn't just events in his past, as he reported them, which would seem to suggest Father Alt suffered from psychotic delusions, either that or he was genuinely experiencing something supernatural. After Father Herman handed Father Alt a letter from Annalise, Father Alt claimed he was unable to read it because all of a sudden I became so nauseated that I thought that at any moment I was going to faint. I experienced a strange excitation such as I had never been subject to before. That night, while preparing to deliver mass on behalf of Annalise, Father Alt claimed, All of a sudden something hit me in the back. The air turned cold, and at the same time there was an intense stench as though something were burning. 
I had to lean against the altar. With great effort and only by dint of considerable concentration was I able to speak the rest of the text. I felt deeply distressed, as if a negative force were surrounding me, which, however, aside from vexing me, could inflict no real harm. Through the night, Father Alt claimed he was unable to sleep, and that he began smelling various stenches as well as the sweet fragrance of violets, the same scent Annalise had described during her first experience of phantosmia. Father Alt also claimed to hear similar thumping sounds coming from his wardrobe, and described a similar euphoric experience as that of Annalise Michelle, stating that his field of vision had been very much narrowed, and his color perception was reduced. The next day, Father Alt claimed the other priests of the parish also began smelling the same foul odors, which would suggest they had a source independent of Father Alt's own experiential awareness, i.e. they were more than just a hallucination. I cannot find any corroborating testimony that this was true, so maybe they did, maybe they didn't. I think the hypothesis that this was a case of mass hysteria cannot be discounted, however, unfortunately I was not able to find anybody who uh, was qualified to speak on the subject that would, that would get back to me. I would like, however, to point out that in Father Alt's defense, yes, that, that's right, a Satanist is going to come to a Catholic priest's defense, the psychiatrists that evaluated his case actually contradicted themselves, both claiming that parts of his history suggest the presence of a psychosis of the schizophrenic type, and that his visions that he describes in their scenic and pictorial character are not what might be expected, for instance, in the case of a schizophrenic psychosis. They must be considered, rather, as pseudo-hallucinations. All of the tests to which Father Alt was submitted found him to be perfectly normal. By all accounts, there was no indication that he was schizophrenic, or any more prone to delusional beliefs than other deeply religious people. I must concur with Felicitas Goodman and others that the psychiatrists in this case did Father Alt dirty and gave the courts an inaccurate and unjust characterization that had them siding in favor of the prosecution. Upon meeting Annalise in person, Father Alt said his first impression of her was that she looked in no way ill or sickly, but she was pale and very serious. As far as I can recall, she said verbatim, I am looking for people who would believe me. She never used the word possessed, and from the conversation there was no way in which one could conclude that she was. I don't think she knew what exactly the word meant, and I must confess that neither was I clear on the theological concept of possession. On November 28, 1973, another EEG was performed during sleep, and the neurologist who examined it, Dr. Ermgard Schleip, found epileptic patterns referring to a discharge in the left temporal region. Dr. Schleip changed Annalise's medication from Dilantin to the anticonvulsant and mood-stabilizing Tegretol, believing that her visual and olfactory hallucinations were likely the result of her epilepsy. Despite the new medication, Annalise's condition gradually worsened. She described herself as feeling as though she were torn between planes of consciousness, one in which she could engage with others normally, and the other in which she felt as though she were at the mercy of a foreign entity. She struggled to assert herself and maintained that at times she felt as though someone or something else were commanding her. Her grades began to suffer, and she had difficulty at times even motivating herself to get out of bed. She stopped associating with her normal group of friends and became drawn to a group of students considered to be religious zealots, conservatives who opposed the changes the Catholic Church had adopted in the wake of the Second Vatican Council. By March 1974, her olfactory hallucinations had briefly ceased, although she continued to see demonic faces and gradually became more and more withdrawn and distraught over the fact that no one seemed to believe the faces she seen were real, but were merely the products of her own mind. In April 1974, she visited Dr. Schleip again, and the doctor reported that, We assumed from a description that small seizures had probably occurred once more. While it's not clear exactly what description Dr. Schleip is referring to, Annalise had been complaining of severe headaches, chronic fatigue, and slowed reflexes. A follow-up EEG with Dr. Schleip was much improved, but there still seemed to be more indication of the existence of a locus of brain damage in the left temporal region. It's important to note that these symptoms, severe headaches, signs of low sodium levels such as extreme drowsiness, changes in mood or behavior, depression or suicidal thoughts, are all known side effects of Tegretol, so it's difficult to ascertain what may have been a side effect of the medication and what may have been due to whatever underlying condition, supernatural or otherwise, was responsible for her seizures and visions. As none of the anticonvulsant or antipsychotic medications that Annalise had been taking for over nearly five years had done anything to dispel the visions of grimacing faces, Father Alt concluded that Annalise, while perhaps not possessed, was possibly suffering from circumcessio, which, according to Daniel Barth in The Exorcist of Sambori, the mentality of an 18th century Franciscan friar, is an external condition of threat where the demons approach humans, scare them, infest certain locations, and so endanger the inhabitants. In January 1975, Dr. Schleip reported, 
Once again, there were no signs for an elevated tendency towards seizures to be detected in her EEG. Father Alt advised Annalise to get a physical, and in June, Dr. Martin Keller concluded that, physiologically, everything with Annalise was normal. Another EEG came back positive, although Dr. Schleip recommended Annalise continue to take Tegretol. By July, however, Annalise's case had begun taking a turn for the worst. She grew so depressed and anxious, she nearly dropped out of college. Her fatigue was so bad, she stopped eating. She became fixated on the idea that she was damned for all eternity, and once again began behaving with an aversion to sacred objects, and eventually stopped going to church altogether. Most troubling, she was unable to walk without aid, and at times her face would contort into what was variously described as a hideous demonic expression. On August 3rd of 1975, Father Alt performed the rite of minor exorcism on Annalise Michelle, which apparently had little effect, and may even have made things worse. Her behavior became increasingly bizarre, as she ate spiders, flies, coal, and even drank her own urine off the floor. She would only sleep one or two hours a night, spending all night running through the house or in prayer, and screaming to Jesus Christ for mercy. Despite her fervent praying, she also destroyed rosaries or religious pictures hanging on the wall. Father Alt requested of the Bishop of Würzburg, Josef Stongel, permission to perform the rite of major exorcism, but was denied. Michelle didn't take this news well, writing to Father Alt, I am nothing. Everything about me is vanity. What should I do? I have to improve myself. Pray for me. Annalise began engaging in self-harming behavior, as well as lashing out violently at her family and friends, hitting, scratching, throwing things, biting. She would perform between 400 to 600 genuflections a day in prayer. Accounts vary. Until her knees swelled. At times she would go catatonic and be unresponsive for up to 10 minutes. Then, after coming to, exclaim she had experienced a vision of the Virgin Mary. One such time, she revealed that the Virgin Mary had explained to her that with the modern changes of the Catholic Church, there was little hope for wayward German youths. Their souls were in jeopardy. Annalise, however, could do penance for them and save their souls from damnation. She also claimed the Virgin Mary told her that she would be the one to carry on the work of prophetess Barbara Weigand. In September 1975, Bishop Josef Stongel, after careful consideration and good information, and consulting with the aforementioned Father Rodewick, formally approved the rite of exorcism to be performed according to the Ritual Romanum. This was based entirely on faith in the written correspondence of Father Alt. Bishop Stongel did not ask for any documentation of Annalise's mental health history or any second opinion from a psychiatrist or a neurologist. The exorcism was to be carried out by Father Alt and Father Arnold Rentz and was performed on September 24, 1975, and from then on until July 1976, an average of one or two exorcisms were performed per week, lasting roughly four hours. Now, despite the bishop's admonishment for secrecy, Father Rentz permitted some of the 67 exorcisms to be recorded. From that, 42 cassette tapes were produced, which would later be used as evidence during the trial. The demons, and I want to make sure everyone knows that I'm using scare quotes, identified themselves on tape as Judas, Nero, Cain, and even Hitler. There was one more personage that Annalise was allegedly possessed by, a disgraced former Bavarian priest named Valentin Fleischmann. Yes, like the yeast. Many people will point to Father Renz's testimony that there's absolutely no way Annalise could have had knowledge of Fleischmann. He was just too obscure a figure. However, they'll conveniently overlook the fact that Father Rentz had discussed Fleischmann with Annalise's parents, and it's quite possible that she may have overheard him or otherwise learned about him from Rentz. I also don't think that it's impossible that, given her intense interest in religious literature and the fact that Fleischmann was also Bavarian, she might have read about him in one of her books. No examples of glossolalia were present during the exorcisms. Judas didn't speak in Aramaic, Nero answered in Latin, but Annalise was familiar with that language through both church and school, and Hitler spoke her native German. As a test, Father Renz questioned Annalise, or one of the demonic personalities, in Chinese, to which the response was, if you want to ask something, ask it in German, although Annalise, or the demon, quickly followed up with, but I did understand that. To be fair to Father Renz, other attempts were made to test whether or not Annalise was truly possessed. Father Renz purportedly filled five bottles with water, some with tap water, and some with holy water. The bottles were unmarked, yet Annalise still responded only when the holy water was used. Not to sound like the asshole skeptic, but I'd like to point out that no mention is made of what kind of control conditions, if any, may have been implemented to ensure that Annalise wouldn't have known which bottles were which. It's also curious to note that, among many threats and profanities that the alleged demons ranted and raved about, 
They also seemed peculiarly interested in the modern changes the Catholic Church was undergoing, the very ones that both Annalise and her group of fundamentalist friends at school opposed. For example, and this is from the audio tapes that Father Rents permitted to be recorded, in church, all too few pray because the priests think it unfashionable. The communion rails must go back in. Priests must be recognizable as priests. They also may not get married. Holy water should come back in the homes, and the crucifix should return to its place of honor in homes. Why would demons be so interested in matters which clearly would be detrimental to their own diabolical interests? The demons claimed to be gloating about the reforms of the Second Vatican Council, claiming responsibility for leading the church astray. However, they also claimed at times that it was the Virgin Mary, compelling them to reveal these harmful secrets. Of course, an alternative explanation is that, through the personalities and voices of her alleged demons, Annalise found a means for making her own displeasure known. Once the exorcisms commenced, Annalise refused further medical treatment and requested her parents stop consulting with doctors and instead trust fully in the power of exorcism. By this time, she had stopped eating, claiming that she wasn't permitted to eat. During the exorcisms, she was forcibly restrained, and the autopsy report later indicated she had fractured teeth and bruised limbs, in addition to blackened eyes which were also visible in the horrific photos which were taken during the exorcism and are publicly available. The autopsy report concluded she had also broken her knees from constant genuflexion. On the day of the last exorcism, June 30th, 1976, Annalise Michelle weighed nearly 30 to 34 kilograms. Accounts vary, or between 68 and 72 pounds. Her last words were request, please, absolution, and mama, stay with me, I'm afraid. The next day, around 8 a.m., Anna Michelle found her daughter dead. The autopsy report declared the cause of death to be advanced emaciation owing to severe malnutrition and dehydration. Later that year, Chief Prosecutor Carl Stanger charged both Annalise's parents and fathers Alt and Rents with negligent homicide, arguing that Annalise's death could have been prevented with medical intervention up to a week prior to her death. When asked why medical intervention had not been sought, Father Alt stated that he never considered the woman dangerously ill, and that if he had, he would have immediately called for medical assistance. By contrast, Father Rents contemptibly said, The exorcism ritual expressly states that the clergymen should not burden themselves with medical matters. In this, Father Rents was correct, as the rite of exorcism which they were using at the time, the 1614 De Exorcisandis Obsessus a Demonio, from the ritual of Romanum, said nothing about the priest's responsibilities for the physical well-being of the possessed, and instead suggested, the exorcist should guard against giving or recommending any medicine to the patient, but should leave this care to physicians. In the case of Annalise Michel, there were no physicians. One would expect prudence, if not pity, would have motivated the priests to act. Bishop Stengel explained that neither he nor Father Rodewick had had any direct contact with Annalise or her parents during the nine-month period of exorcisms, and were unaware that she was not receiving medical attention. Father Rents testified that he had written to the bishop prior to Annalise's death that her condition was deteriorating, but had received no response. The trial began March 30, 1978. Fathers Alton Rents were both represented by lawyers appointed by and paid for by the Catholic Church. Josef and Anna Michelle were represented by one of Germany's top defense lawyers, Eric Schmidt Leichner, who had made something of a name for himself defending several ex-Nazis in war crime trials. Not exactly an encouraging sign. Chief Prosecutor Stanger recommended the parents be spared jail time after the ordeal of losing their daughter, the concept of suffering enough actually being a criterion under the Strafgesetzbuch, the German penal code, and that fathers Alt and Rents ought to be fined. Ultimately, Anna, Josef, Father Alt, and Father Rents were all found guilty of negligent homicide and were sentenced to six months in jail, which was reduced to three years probation as well as a fine. After the trial, Anna and Yosef requested permission to have their daughter exhumed and reburied, the justification being that Annalise had been hurriedly buried in a cheaply made coffin. Not incidentally, it was understood among the families and Father Alt and Father Rents that if her body did not show signs of decomposition, that would supposedly be a sign of a miracle, and would indicate that she had in fact been possessed. One might well wonder why, if her parents truly believed her body would not decompose, they would be requesting she be reburied in a better coffin, unless the plan was to exhume the body for the express purpose of confirming whether or not it had begun to decompose. Nearly two years after her burial, on the 25th of February, 1978, the remains of Annalise Michel were replaced in a new oak coffin lined with tin. 
The official reports state that the body bore the signs of consistent deterioration, something which the men who disinterred the body confirmed. So much for a miracle. To this day, the grave of Annalise Michel remains a holy site, a place of pilgrimage for those who believe in her possession. Annalisa's symptoms certainly fit the criteria of a tonic-clonic seizure, and I would argue if we consider the account of Annalise praying the rosary, during which she experienced a euphoric feeling and smelled something akin to violets, there's good reason to believe she also at times experienced aura. Her hands being outstretched like cat's paws likely were the result of muscle contractions, and her eyes turning all black were likely her pupils dilating, something which is not unheard of during seizures. All of the behavioral changes which Annalise displayed are consistent with temporal lobe epilepsy, both ictal and inner ictal, that is, during and between the onset of seizure, experiences of depersonalization derealization have long been associated with complex partial seizures arising from the frontal lobe. Other behavioral characteristics unique to persons with temporal lobe epilepsy include hyperreligiosity, a psychopathological form of extreme religiosity, a drastically reduced interest in sex, and a tendency to withdraw from human contact in general. These were all behavioral characteristics that Annalise Michelle displayed. She became severely depressed and remained so for long periods of time, stating, This is no longer a depression, this is a condition. She claimed, Someone else is manipulating me, and stated, My will is not my own. She mentioned to her psychiatrist that she couldn't love sufficiently, that she felt castrated, ice cold, and told her boyfriend, I can't feel any love at all. I'm all numb, sort of. I can't feel emotion like that. She stopped associating with her normal group of friends and became drawn to the group of students that were considered religious zealots. One of her childhood friends put it like this, After her illness, Annalise was changed. She was quiet and withdrew from her friends. I also noted that she kept wanting to carry on mostly religious conversations. For her part, Annalise became convinced of her own damnation and began warning others of the imminent end of the world, which is consistent with hyper-religiosity. The alleged superhuman strength demonstrated by Annalise, such as when her boyfriend Peter, quote, saw her take an apple and effortlessly squeeze it with one hand so that the fragments exploded throughout the room, while impressive, is anything but supernatural. Multiple videos exist online demonstrating UFC fighters like Sage Northcutt, as well as non-MMA fighters with sufficient grip strength, are perfectly capable of this feat. It's not unreasonable to believe, with a surge in cortisol levels, Annalise would have been likewise capable of seemingly remarkable feats of strength, although the account of her doing so effortlessly, to where the apple literally exploded in fragments across the room, may be a bit exaggerated. One of the more interesting aspects of this case, which we talked about a lot on Three Tortured Souls, was the foul odor. Although it arguably began as phantosmia, the nature of this stench changed over time. At first, she started smelling a horrid stench not perceived by others. This would suggest olfactory hallucinations that occur in persons with epileptic seizures. By the time of her pilgrimage to Italy in 1973, however, Father Alt related, she exuded a stench like Frau Hein had never smelled before, like fecal matter or something burning. Everyone in the bus could smell it. This would seem to indicate that the source of the stench was Annalise herself. Further evidence in support of this comes from a visit Father Roth paid to the Michelle household. Air Michelle received me and took me immediately to the living room. It was filled with a horrible stench, of something burning, and of dung, that penetrated everything. Air Michelle expressly called my attention to it and told me that Annalise had been in the room just before. In the other rooms of the Michelle home, and on the outside, I could detect no trace. The odor was also not always present. During the criminal investigation in October of 1976, Father Hagberg recalled his first meeting with Annalise and mentioned nothing of an odor. Father Herrmann, who met with Annalise about ten times from 1973 to 1975, stated, From her parents, I heard that on occasion she evidenced disrespect towards sacred objects, and there was a stench of dung or of something burning in the room where she was. However, these symptoms never occurred in my apartment. Likewise, none of Annalise's doctors, classmates, or teachers ever complained of a foul odor emanating from or percolating around the girl. Her boyfriend, Peter, was also completely unaware of her problem with the odor until she mentioned to him how it plagued her. We know that adrenaline increases the production of apocrine sweat, making body odor more intense during times of stress. Remember the occasions during which people reported the smell. In each case, Annalise was under conditions of stress or anxiety specifically with respect to her belief in demonic possession. 
the stresses of college, navigating her relationship with a boyfriend, none of these seemed to have triggered the malodor. It was only during times when Annalise was under a religious altered state of consciousness that anyone noticed the smell. While I can't rule out that this was the result of demonic activity, an alternative explanation may be that Annalise was suffering from bromidrosis, body odor, as a result of adrenic stimulation of her apocrine glands. This is a conclusion that author and anthropologist Felicitas Goodman also entertained, stating, The characteristic stench began to fade during the exorcism, something noted by all the participants, and a pleasant fragrance appeared instead. The report on pleasant fragrances is so persistent that it may be a translation of the neurochemical changes of the religious altered state of consciousness, leading to the pleasure center into olfactory terms. I spoke to Dr. Dustin Portella, a dermatologist, and he said while this hypothesis sounds plausible, fecal smell wouldn't usually be the same as bromidrosis smell, and suggested that perhaps Annalise had poor self-hygiene. His reasoning was that, if she was exhibiting any schizoid-type personality traits, there is evidence to suggest the olfactory sense does not work well. Schizoid people often do smell very bad, and have bad hygiene because they don't know if they smell bad. They're incapable of smelling it. In this case, however, Annalise was aware of the smell. In fact, there were several times in which she alerted other people to it. Unfortunately, we don't have much information as to what her daily routine or personal hygiene was like. It is a fact that, at least towards the end of her life, she had to be cared for and bathed by her sister. However, the problem with the odor had been occurring for years before that. In her discussion on Three Tortured Souls, Kenny Biddle brought up the fact that, at times, the odor was described as smelling either like something burning or like fecal matter, which may indicate that there was more than one smell. There are a couple of plausible explanations where a burning smell might have come from. First, being that the Michelles were a Catholic family, it's possible they may have had prayer candles in the house. We also know that they had at least one fireplace, because Annalise was seen to be eating coal from it. Fecal matter has a rather straightforward source of origin, and the simplest explanation is that Annalise herself was the source of the fecal smell. It was only ever present when she was in the room, or lingered in the room after she had left. If it wasn't due to poor hygiene, the other explanation is flatulence. I know, that probably sounds ridiculous, but there's at least one account mentioned by Goodman that I believe suggests this might be the explanation in at least some cases. Goodman relates how Taya Hine told her, one day while she was driving Annalise to a train station, We were almost there when she said, Watch it, Thea. In a moment there's going to be a strong smell of something burning. And it did happen right then and there. I stopped the car because we could not stand the stench. I had to open all the doors of my Opal caravan. We waited about ten minutes, then we drove on to the depot. I'm sorry. I mean no disrespect, but that sounds exactly like what would happen if somebody were to rip one in the car. Knowing that it's coming, warning someone, it must have been particularly bad if they had to pull over, but then it was gone in about 10 minutes? It's non-scientific, but speaking from personal experience, a fart can absolutely linger in a room for up to 10 minutes. And in a car, that's a small confined space, especially if, you know, say the windows don't go down all the way. We'll never know for sure exactly what was making the smell, but I just don't see a compelling reason to blame it on demons. One final point I would like to address is the question of whether or not Annalise had temporal lobe epilepsy. Felicitas Goodman argued, There is sufficient evidence to support the contention that Annalise was indeed not sick, that she was not an epileptic, that what looked to the uninformed like symptoms of a disease were actually manifestations of a religious experience. Goodman's argument seems predicated on the fact that multiple EEGs, in addition to the autopsy report after her death, failed to indicate anything abnormal with Annalise's temporal lobe no anatomical defects, tumors, or scarring. However, this is not unusual. In roughly one in four cases of temporal lobe epilepsy, the cause remains unknown. Many different factors may cause temporal lobe epilepsy, including infections such as encephalitis or meningitis, malformations of the blood vessels in the brain, or genetic mutations. One might argue, if Annalise really did have the temporal lobe epilepsy, why the medications she were taking didn't help. Annalise herself frequently complained that they weren't helping. Naturally, the question to ask is whether or not the person is taking the medication as prescribed, which, by several accounts, Annalise was. However, on page 245 of Goodman's book, it says, Roswitha remembers that Annalise often took less than three tablets per day of Tegretol when her prescription was beginning to run out, and then made up for it as soon as it was renewed by taking more than the prescribed dosage. Goodman relates this to Tegretol screwing up Annalise's ability to initiate or control her possession state, which I think is bullshit. I actually think this testimony, if true, worse to discredit Goodman's argument that Annalise didn't have temporal lobe epilepsy. 
If Annalise wasn't taking her medication as prescribed, we can hardly be surprised that her condition didn't improve. We don't need to suppose that something else was going on. If Annalise did not have a neurological disorder, there was no brain-based origin for her seizures or hallucinations, then what exactly did prompt them? Goodman, a cultural anthropologist who wrote extensively about altered states of consciousness, periods of wakefulness characterized by a religious or mystical nature, believed that what Annalise was experiencing was an altered state of consciousness. However, there's two points against this I would like to make. First, it's well documented by authors like Baer and Fedio that persons with temporal lobe epilepsy do have experiences which they characterize as mystical or religious in nature. So, I'm not arguing that Annalise didn't experience altered states of consciousness, but again, they're not inconsistent with temporal lobe epilepsy. Second, the experience of being demonically possessed is meaningfully different than, say, holy rollers or whirling dervishes working themselves into trance-like states. Annalise did not exhibit control over her seizures or possession states. Furthermore, they didn't seem to be induced by her expectation of an exorcism session. In other words, there didn't seem to be any kind of conditioning where she would have a seizure or become possessed in anticipation of an exorcism. <laughs> Treating mental illness or behavioral disorders isn't easy. There's no magic bullet cure. It's not uncommon for people to need to change medications many times before they find something that works for them, or doesn't have nasty side effects. Several times over the years, Annalise complained that the medications she was on didn't seem to work. She was on anticonvulsants, yet she still had seizures. She was on antipsychotics, yet she still experienced hallucinations. Unfortunately, the first SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, were not invented until the 1980s. During the time Annalise was alive, the only drugs available to treat mood disorders were monoamine oxidase inhibitors, MAOIs, and tricyclic antidepressants, both of which were known to have adverse side effects and a high potential for toxicity. It's possible for those reasons she was never prescribed medications for mood disorder. On the one hand, given the medical intervention was not stopped until during her exorcisms, she had a long decline leading up to that point. Yes, the prescriptions were filled, but there's reason to believe Annalise wasn't taking them as prescribed. None of her doctors noticed they obviously weren't having an effect. We have testimony that Annalise mentioned her concerns to her doctors, yet none of them seemed concerned that she was still experiencing hallucinations, or that her behavior was becoming more unusual and depressed. Dave Schumacher brings up a fair point in asking why her doctors weren't held as accountable for failing to take care of her as the priests or her family. Ultimately, if someone is going to go through with having an exorcism performed, I would argue that it needs to be done as an alternative form of medicine, and in conjunction with evidence-based treatment. There is reason to believe Annalise Michelle wasn't taking her medication as prescribed. Quitting any kind of medication cold turkey is a terrible idea. Additionally, even though the rite of major exorcism from the Ritual Romanum didn't call for it at the time, doctors and other medical personnel should have been involved throughout the exorcisms. If they had, maybe her life could have been saved. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you all enjoyed the show. If you liked it, please consider subscribing. It's on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Stitcher. If you have any questions or want to stay up to date on the latest articles I publish from Skeptical Inquirer or whenever a new episode goes live, you can follow me on my Facebook page, The Devil in the Details. The Devil of Doubt calls forth mankind to challenge all things, question all things. May the Luciferian light of reason guide you on your way ever forward. Hail science. Hail reason. Hail Satan. <laughs>